This presentation is the first in a two-part series relating to enteral feeding administration. This part focuses on gastric residual volumes and has been created by the Clinical Nutrition Department. At the end of this training, you will understand the importance of nutritional adequacy in hospitalized patients, examine and ultimately recall evidence for reducing dependence on checking gastric residual volumes, identify aspiration risk factors, utilize appropriate practices to reduce aspiration risk, and implement the new Casa policy on GRBs. To begin, it is important to understand the weight that nutrition plays in patient outcomes. Malnutrition affects half of hospitalized patients due to a variety of factors and remains significantly underdiagnosed. As a result of poor nutrition status, patients are more likely to experience longer hospital stays and increased rates of infection, as well as increased morbidity and mortality. To make matters worse, patients on average receive only 60% of what's ordered. This is primarily due to interrupted feeding schedules. Tube feeding is unexpectedly held for a variety of reasons. Within the critical care setting, 25% can be attributed to NPO after midnight orders placed in preparation for tests and procedures, 25% to issues with the enteral access device, such as tube clogging and replacement, and 33% to perceived patient intolerance. Of this perceived intolerance, only half represents true intolerance. It is this portion of the graph that we have the power to reduce or eliminate. In a survey assessment, 97% of nurses reported assessing intolerance solely on elevated GRVs of 200 to 250 mils. They subsequently held the feeding due to fear of putting the patient at increased risk for aspiration pneumonia. Since this has been cause for such great concern, let's take a look at the facts regarding gastric residual volumes. It turns out that GRVs are not correlated with pneumonia, aspiration, or regurgitation. Specifically, randomized controlled trials have shown that raising the cutoff value for, for GRVs from a lower amount, such as 50 to 150 mils, to a higher number, 250 to 500 mils, does not increase the incidence of pneumonia, aspiration, or regurgitation. Likewise, eliminating GRV checks altogether in no way increases a patient's risk for any of these outcomes. On the flip side, however, holding tube feeding due to high GRVs alone is associated with more frequent tube clogging, insufficient feeding, and poor nutrition status, as well as increased demands on nursing time and healthcare resources. As noted here, holding the feeding cannot be seen as playing it safe. Rather, it should be a reality that we avoid in the absence of legitimate intolerance. To better understand why the presence of residuals do not increase patient risk for aspiration pneumonia, consider the physiology portrayed on the following slides. Although each individual will be slightly different, the average stomach holds one liter of food or fluid comfortably, but can expand to hold a maximum of four liters. Now consider that the fasted stomach is not empty. Without any tube feeding or food provided, the average person produces 500 to 1500 mils of saliva and 2000 to 4000 mils of gastric secretions per day. This totals two and a half to five and a half liters of fluid per day. When this daily saliva production and gastric secretions are added together, then divided by 24 hours in the day, these endogenous secretions alone can be equated to 188 mil per hour rate. If the average tube feeding rate is 60 mils per hour, this equates to only a quarter of the total gastric fluid present at any given time. When endogenous secretions and tube feeding are added together, the total gastric fluid itself remains only a quarter of the average stomach. So next time you take a residual, don't think of it as pure enteral feeding. Remember that it is likely a diluted mixture of tube feeding and endogenous fluid, a substance which would likely exist regardless of feeding.
Also note the volume and context of a comfortably full one liter stomach, which is a natural reservoir. Now that we have put gastric residual volumes in better context and reduced their significance in evaluating risk for aspiration, let's take a look at what is associated with increased aspiration risk. The list is as follows. Inability to protect the airway. Mechanical ventilation. Age of greater than 70 years. Reduced level of consciousness. Poor oral care. Supine positioning and acid reflux. Although a majority of these factors cannot be changed, it is important to keep them in mind as their presence will influence the choices we make when delivering tube feeding. Also note that the two factors in dark blue are modifiable. In order to reduce aspiration risk, here are the most current evidence-based practices which should guide enteral feeding administration. In all patients receiving tube feeding, a 30 to 45 degree head of bed should be maintained at all times. In order to comply with this standard, staff must ensure patients hinge at the waist and do not slide down in the bed. Studies have consistently shown that beds are set to shallower angles than expected. Level of degree can be read using the blue angle indicator with metal ball or the electronic screen on the bed. Nursing should also focus efforts on maintaining good oral hygiene by using chlorhexidine mouthwash twice a day. Finally, nurses should adopt daily checks for physical signs of intolerance in all tube-fed patients. Signs of abdominal distension, patient complaints of abdominal pain and or abdominal guarding upon palpation, and episodes of vomiting are all grounds to hold feeding and notify the MD. Bowel frequency and quantity should also be noted, although abnormalities of this kind should not prompt immediate holding. Rather, medications and medical conditions should be considered as possible causes. In the event that a patient exhibits poor physical tolerance and has especially high aspiration risk, based on the list shown in the previous slide, Additional actions may be employed to improve tolerance. This includes inserting a J-tube which bypasses the stomach and diverts feeding into the jejunum, switching from bolus to pump-based feeding if applicable, and starting a prokinetic medication to speed gastric emptying. In August of this year, the nursing policy on enteral feeding was revised to reflect evidence-based guidelines on gastric residual volumes. Here, it requires an assessment that focuses on physical signs of intolerance, such as abdominal distension, pain, nausea, or vomiting, be completed every four hours for the tube-fed patient. Signs of overt physical intolerance alone should prompt the nurse to hold the feeding. On the other hand, while checking gastric residuals remains in place, the nurse should only hold the feeding if 500 mils or greater is observed in the absence of physical intolerance. To view the policy in more detail, follow the trail listed at the bottom in italics.